kind of nervous about this video. Hi booktube! Welcome to the first real video in a series of videos that I want to kind of indefinitely make throughout my time on this channel. Medievalist mutterings, um, because I'm a medievalist and I like alliteration. It's kind of a series where I'm going to talk about a medieval topic, um, mostly related to literature but sometimes maybe just kind of context. Um, whatever I feel like at the time. Yeah, I'm a student, I'm not an expert, so if I do to say anything that's wrong or you don't agree with, please respectfully reply in the comments. I am but a simple undergraduate, um, graduate, <laughs> that studied some medieval topics whilst doing her literature degree, so, um, that's, that's it. So, that's my disclaimer done. And, um, this specific video is going, I've titled The Anatomy of Manuscripts because it's all kind of a general thing about manuscripts, just kind of about the setup of a manuscript, how it works, like some of the terminology. Probably not the most interesting video, but I thought it was a good um, starting point and a basis to kind of introduce some people to the medieval world. Um, so yeah, I hope you like it and we'll go right now. Woo um, first of all, the word manuscript um, seems a good place to start. And it literally just means written by hand. So we are dealing with um, the pre-printing age. When we talk about medieval manuscripts, we are dealing with things written between the end of the 4th century with the fall of the Roman Empire and the birth of the Codex, up until the 16th century with the Gutenberg Bible and the birth of the printing press. You'll notice I just use the term Codex. And um, basically, for those unaware, this is what we call a manuscript when it's bound together to form what we modern lot would call a book rather than a scroll um, or a tablet, it's something that you can turn, you turn the pages and you can refer back. We don't say book in medieval terms really, you say codex or for the plural it is codices. Printing became a, a kind of mass thing after the Gutenberg Bible. Writing manuscripts by hand just wasn't cost effective anymore, it was a dying art and um, the printing, printing press became all of the rage. Um, but this is before that. Before there'd be writing on papyrus, in scrolls, in the Roman Empire, etc. Um, or even on stone or clay, on like tablets. And medieval manuscripts, on the most part, are written on parchment or vellum. Um, I think the two terms are basically interchangeable. Vellum might just be a finer or more expensive um, type of parchment, but I'm not sure. Um, they're basically the same thing. They are animal skin that's been prepared to resemble something that's kind of similar to our paper but is a lot more durable considering the fact that a lot of these manuscripts are over a thousand years old and I have some books from my childhood that have already fallen apart. <laughs> One of the things that I find fascinating about manuscripts that you don't really get with the average printed book is the amount of information you can get from the, just the book itself, like not even reading the words, just looking at it. Um, for example, um, you can tell where where a manuscript was written, or when it was written down through the scribe's handwriting, or the dialect through which it was written. Those unaware, for a long time during the medieval period, there was no standard written form. Like, for example, today, we have a standard written form. Someone writing English in Scotland um, will look completely the same for someone writing English in, the, in, in Cornwall, in the south of England. Um, just because, you know, the words, the words look the same, but in the medieval period, words were written phonetically, so Middle English um, was written how it sounded. So someone writing in Scotland or the Midlands, um, for example, the Gwain poet, looks very different um, to someone writing um, in the south, such as Chaucer. There's also, um, you can tell proof of trade as well through a manuscript just being there. For example, you can look at the paint pigments. Um, in the colours of ink that are used on the page, for example, if you're looking at something like the Lindisfarne Gospels or something with a lot and lot of blue as well, um, there's a really there's a really famous paint pigment that's a really rich, brilliant blue um, called lapis lazuli, and it was so expensive. But I, I think, if I'm correct, it originates somewhere near or in Afghanistan. There's, there's proof of trade between these people and greater world, even outside of Europe. So. Um, that's really cool, I think. You can also estimate how much a manuscript was commissioned for. For some perspective, 
a probably an expensive manuscript um today would equate um is if you were to commission a building so it is expensive stuff cool thing that happens in manuscripts is if there is a lot of blank space at the edges of a manuscript um, and it's a large manuscript anyway you can tell that it's basically just kind of showing that they have loads of money they're like i have so much money that i don't even need to fill a whole page like i can i can afford to have unused vellum on this on this codec also if there's like the really brilliant blue like i said lapis lazuli and gold and gold leaf on pages if something is big with margins with gold and really brilliant blue of lapis lazuli then you can tell that the person was probably extremely affluent so good on them okay so this is the boring part of the video where i'm just going to go through some cool things like cool terminology that i think is interesting me personally i find this interesting um i'm going to start with a simple one which is illuminated manuscript um you've probably heard this term before um basically illuminated manuscript has come become a general term for medieval manuscripts over time but technically technically it is only um true if the manuscript has gold leaf um because the gold literally illuminates the page isn't that nice I think it is. Marginalia is the next thing I'm talking about. Marginalia. Uh, marginalia is the Latin word for things in the margin, either writing or decoration in the margins. Um, a lot of the time marginalia is actually um, reader additions or annotations, but it can be like glosses um, where you like put definitions of words. It's also why I encourage the annotation of your books because the medieval peeps did it all the time and it's fun to look at, so we should just annotate our books so people can look at it. Okay, there's um, three terms now that I want to talk about, and that is um, three different types of initial. Um, an initial is basically um, when you have a piece of text and then the first letter is really, really big. So for example, in the term once upon a time, and you have the really big O, it would be in it, the O is the initial. There's a simple decorated initial, which is obvious, it's kind of, an initial that is just ornately decorated to look nice. Um, there is an anthropomorphic initial, which is um, a letter that's formed out of a person's body. So it would be like a kind of person, I'm not gonna do it, but it would be like a person twisting the body to form an O or whatever letter it is. And finally, there is a historiated initial. So if we did have the O in Once Upon a Time, um, it would probably, the O would be a frame and it would have a picture inside. And if there's a picture inside the, um, the initial, then it is a historiated initial. I will obviously put pictures right here as well. The next term I want to talk about is badipage. Um, they, it literally means in, I think it's in French, the bottom of the page. So, um, this is a really interesting one because if you are a patron of a manuscript, if you're commissioning a manuscript, um, you will obviously have reign over what happens on that manuscript. But um, it was kind of a tradition to let the artist, scribe, illuminator, whatever you want to call it, um, have free reign to do whatever they really wanted at the bottom of a page of a manuscript. Because the top is where the important stuff happens. It's where the heading is, it's where the text is. You know, it's where, you know, you're paying for that. But the bottom of the page, people can do whatever they want. And that is where you find some some weird shit I have to say um there's a lot of things that what medievalists call grotesques um I'll put a few pictures here of different code grotesques that you can find in the bottom of manuscript the next time I want to talk about is rubrication um which is quite a cool word it basically means like headings or words that kind of separate different paragraphs they'll usually be written in red I think um basically um because I think I think it's probably because of the limited space and you didn't want to waste any parchment or vellum that there isn't really chapter headings and you don't really get separate pages for different subjects sometimes so um for someone that wants to skim the book and get to a certain place there will be rubrication throughout telling kind of giving you information of what the next section is talking about is is helpful when you're navigating your way through a manuscript you need rubrication um and finally i just want to say if each leaf of a manuscript is called a folio, and there is front matter and back matter. Front would be called the verso, and the back is called the recto. So, um, 
that's how you navigate your way through manuscripts. Some interesting facts and terminology. I'm sorry that it kind of became a definition lesson, but um, I thought it was an interesting and important video to make to do with manuscripts and why I like manuscripts. I'm also going to put some links below for like documentaries or um, books or websites that you might find interesting. If you found anything that I've said interesting, then you can go and get one of these things or look at one of these things and learn some more um, because it's probably <laughs> more helpful than me. But um, yeah, that is all I want to say today. I'm really scared that this will not be interesting, but um, we'll just we'll just go with it. So um, yeah, hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.